Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am Stephen Collins. I'm the CEO of Matter, and happy to welcome you to a webinar on a new report that the Peterson Health Technology Institute has released on digital solutions to treat musculoskeletal conditions. Um, a little bit about Matter. Our mission is to accelerate the pace of change of healthcare. We do several things to advance that purpose. We run an incubator for healthcare startups. Since we launched in 2015, we've worked with about a thousand companies from around the world. They range from very early to growth stage startups. And in aggregate, our member companies have raised more than $5 billion to fuel their growth. We also run accelerators, six or seven a year, all in partnership with large health systems, life sciences companies, payers, associations. We're currently in the middle of several, including one that's focused on vision care together with VSP Vision. The final showcase for that accelerator is August 15th, both in person at Matter, as well as live streamed, in case you're interested. Um, in addition to that, we also work with large companies, large enterprises to help them build their innovation capabilities. We have a suite of education and training and insight services that help them make sense of emerging technologies and figure out uh, how to harvest them. Um, we are a nexus for people who are passionate about healthcare innovation. We bring people together to be inspired and learn, and uh, that's what I hope uh, you will get from the next 57 minutes. Uh, my guest today is Caroline Pearson, who runs the Peterson Health Technology Institute, opened last year to provide independent evaluations for digital health uh, technologies. Caroline designed and launched the organization, and so far they've released two reports. Their first one, which was focused on digital diabetes management solutions, came out in April. Um, their uh, it was fairly negative report on things through their analysis. They basically found that digital diabetes management solutions uh, aren't worth the investment. Um, and Carolyn and I had a fascinating conversation about that report in early May. Um, if you're interested, you can go to matter.health slash live and look at the recording. But today we're going to talk about their second report, which is focused on virtual musculoskeletal solutions. And this time they found that the solutions, um, or at least... Uh, certain categories of the solutions do provide a strong return on investment. Um, so Caroline's going to start out with a brief presentation of uh, about the PHTI and their findings, um, and then I'm going to lead a discussion with her. If you have questions at any point, please use the Q&A function. I'll do my best to weave them into the conversation. Um, Caroline, thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, I really enjoyed our conversation last time and very much look forward to uh, the presentation and our discussion um, this time. So with that, uh, welcome, and I'll turn it over to you to share more about your report. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Stephen. So glad to be here. We really appreciate the opportunity to talk about the findings, get the word out, um, and really answer any questions around folks' minds. So excited to for the conversation. Uh, so as Stephen shared, uh, we launched a year ago, and um, what we do at PHTI is provide independent assessments of digital health solutions and other health technologies um, on the basis of their ability to improve health outcomes and lower costs. And so Stephen mentioned we've got two reports under our belt with pretty different findings. Uh, I will emphasize that um, we're really doing this independently. We are entirely self-funded uh, uh, you know, through philanthropic dollars. Um, and so that does give us the opportunity to um, conduct these really independent assessments and just look at what the evidence is and try to share it out. And, um, but I think many people have said, so why, what are you up to? Why are you doing this? Uh, and our philanthropic mission overall is really to improve uh, the performance of the healthcare system, um, particularly increasing affordability and quality. And we think technology has an important role to play in that. And um, that's why I'm really excited to talk about this report today, because I think it really is emblematic of what our thesis was from the beginning, which is that um, technologies that are proven to be clinically effective have the ability to really address some of the critical challenges in our healthcare industry, including um, you know, the need for better health outcomes, um, access challenges, uh, and cost. And you know, this uh, is really a case where these solutions have the potential to hit all three of those needs. So 
you know, our goal is to say, uh, can we help uh, accelerate the market adoption of high performing health technologies? First, by being really clear about what the evidence standards are, and we work very closely with health plans and employers and providers um, to help define those standards um, and, and sort of what information they need. Then we do the assessments to try to identify what the solutions are that um, are working and those that have the potential to save money. And with that, we hope that we can expand their adoption by patients and providers who have more confidence in the technology uh, and ultimately speed the purchaser adoption and the sort of market growth uh, of those companies. Uh, the first report and the second report have generated a lot of uh, interest, um, really uh, tremendous interest from the industry. And we've been very actively engaged um, with stakeholders to hear feedback. Um, you know, and we've heard a wide range of feedback, but I wanted to share some of the things that we've been hearing and, and happy to go further on this. So um, from purchasers, the people that are really making decisions about which digital health solutions to cover and integrate into their systems, um, you know, we've heard just a tremendous appreciation um, and a really substantive engagement with the reports. Uh, you know, as we go and talk, for instance, I was at the health plan conference, um, the AHIP conference um, last month, and, you know, we, you sit with the, the chief medical officers in a room and they say, you know, thank you. This is the kind of information that we need to be making better decisions, thinking about how we're integrating solutions into our systems. Um, and as we're renegotiating or, or re-contracting uh, for some of these solutions, these insights are going to inform our decisions. Um, many of them also say, uh, you know, we've looked at our own data and we actually saw very similar things to what you've said in your reports, but it's very helpful to see validation um, across a broader set of evidence. And so that's been really great to hear um, and I think is really uh, a lot of where we wanted to begin with this information. Um, I've been pleasantly surprised at the amount of interest from investors. Uh, obviously, it's been a turbulent time um, in the sort of digital health venture space. And I think investors are really looking for clarity about what sorts of um, outcomes and, you know, company performance are going to generate growth. And so, you know, there's been a real attraction to the sense that if we can agree on um, what great evidence looks like, then investors can both use that in their diligence process, as well as support the generation of that evidence um, with their portfolio companies. And so um, that has been a really uh, constructive set of dialogues. Um, for the companies themselves, um, you know, we've had a tremendous amount of interest, both from the companies that have been included in the reports, um, who have been very engaged in telling us both what they think we got right and what we think we, they think we got wrong. Uh, and I am sure we'll hear more about that today. Um, but, you know, one of the things that's interesting is we've heard, had a lot of companies come to us and say, you know, we want to produce better evidence. And so can you talk to us about sort of how we're thinking about designing um, our studies and tell us if that would meet your standards so that we can make sure that we're generating things that are going to be valuable in the future. And then finally, I'll mention policymakers. Um, while we are not uh, making any advocacy statements or pushing any policy proposals, you know, this is an area of growing interest both on the Hill and throughout the agencies. And so we speak regularly with people um, throughout CMS, FDA, and the Hill um, just to share the information we're learning and answer their questions. And they've been very uh, engaged and appreciative. Um, so briefly, a review for those of you who tuned in last time. Um, you know, in short, we synthesize the goals of our report um, to really answer the questions that are on these digital health purchasers' minds. And that's really threefold. Do these solutions work and for whom? Meaning, are there certain populations or conditions where the solutions work better than others? Second, how do they work compared to the status quo? And we'll talk a lot about what the status quo is in this instance. And then third, if they are clinically effective, do they have the potential to lower costs? And so that's really the frame in which we approach our evaluations of the clinical impact and the economic impact, building off of our assessment framework, which we developed in partnership with ICER and customized specifically for digital health technologies. We work very hard to be engaged um, with 
folks uh, throughout our process. And so I wanted to describe a little bit more about what some of those relationships look like. This has been an area um, where we've gotten some questions. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we are self-funded. We don't have any revenue models. Um, no one sort of subscribes as a member of our services. Um, but we do actively work with lots of audiences to ensure that we're creating information that's going to be useful. Um, we have an advisory board of folks that are leaders throughout the digital health uh, and investment space. And those are people that are very actively engaged um, in digital health, uh, in the digital health industry. Um, and because many of them are actively engaged in the digital health industry, they give us strategic advice, but they're not directly involved in report generation um, to avoid any conflicts of interest. Second, we have a purchaser advisory council, which includes most of the nation's leading health plans, uh, a growing set of employers, and large health systems who are really helping us understand what sorts of digital health decisions they are looking at and making and what sorts of information would be helpful to, to them from our reports. But again, they're not directly involved in uh, the company selection or anything related to actually the report generation. Within the actual report creation, um, we have a series of partners who are experts in health technology assessment and health economics who um, support our research and evidence reviews. And we work with clinical advisors who are um, custom selected for any given topic area to ensure we have the sorts of input that we need both about sort of existing um, usual care paradigms as well as the integration of digital solutions into that care. For every report, we also do direct research with patients. Um, so in this case, we conducted um, interviews or one small focus group with seven patients that are suffering from different musculoskeletal conditions and have had experience using various um, digital health solutions. And then in every report, we work um, with the digital health companies that are gonna be reviewed and give them the opportunity to submit a variety of um, both clinical as well as commercial and proprietary information to us, which is all reviewed um, for quality and then integrated into the report as appropriate. So let's get to the heart of the matter. The first question is why uh, focus on um, musculoskeletal conditions? And you know this is an area with a tremendous, tremendous disease burden that affects a huge number of people's lives. One in three Americans suffer from an MSK disorder, uh, and that leads to a lot of um, challenges in terms of the ability to, to live daily life, um, people living in pain, and um, people missing work and other, uh, you know, other obligations as a result of their condition. What is notable is that um, from a sort of best care clinical standards point of view, we know what works. And there is evidence that uh, indicates that early and consistent access to physical therapy is proven to have a tremendous uh, you know, result in terms of improving outcomes and reducing spending for a wide variety of musculoskeletal conditions. Uh, and that people who get that care can avoid a lot of other unnecessary and relatively ineffective care, which may include surgery, advanced imaging, opioid medications, um, pain injections, et cetera, steroid injections, and, uh, and so we have this big gap between, you know, the sort of very heterogeneous care that people with uh, MSK conditions uh, receive today and really the best in class care um, that we know that they can, that would help them and uh, is generally a relatively affordable uh, approach. Um, we also know there's access challenges. So um, a lot of patients that would benefit from PT simply do not pursue it. Um, either because of cost that they either perceive or, or it is too expensive for them, um, they have insufficient coverage for that PT and their insurance benefit, um, or they have a variety of access barriers. And that includes um, a lack of physical therapists in certain parts of the country, particularly rural areas. But it also includes difficulty with actually just getting to PT, right? PT clinics um, are generally off open uh, during business hours, during weekdays. And so for folks to get there multiple times a week um, may require taking off of work, may require uh, transportation. And so for instance, in our patient interviews, we heard from older adults um, and people with disabilities 
that actually, while they could do the exercises at PT, getting to PT was a real challenge. As a result of that, we have seen over the last decade a real growth in the number of um, virtual musculoskeletal companies um, that have come to market with digital solutions. And generally speaking, and we're going to go through some of the variations, but generally speaking, what these solutions do is they're really focused on um, virtual PT, and it's the active portion of PT, so exercise-based physical therapy, which people can do in a self-directed manner with computer feedback. So you've got a tablet um, or a phone that is set up that is capturing your video. It's guiding you through the exercises that you should be doing. It's capturing what you are doing and giving the patient feedback about range of motion, reps, et cetera. Um, and then it's turning all of that uh, exercise information into data that can be reviewed on the back end by a physical therapist, but doesn't require a one-to-one -one physical therapist to patient interaction for every exercise program. And then they have a variety of additional sort of data collection um, around, you know, pain and function uh, and how folks are doing. Many of them have mental health components. Uh, and then, you know, they have access to um, both health coaches and physical therapists at different stages of the process. So we sought to look at these solutions and we really wanted to see on the clinical side um, how they affected outcomes. And so we actually looked at 15 outcome measures, but we identified the primary outcome measures being um, pain and functional status, um, which are really sort of the two hallmark issues for judging um, MSK disorders and, their, and folks healing. Um, but there are a number of other important ones, including um, mental health outcomes, including productivity and sort of workplace, the ability to go to work, uh, and many other um, user experience type uh, outcomes, which were found in the literature. Then in looking at the solutions, we really went through and categorized uh, these companies or these solutions into sort of three broad categories. So on the left, you have app-based exercise therapy solutions. And those solutions have that same sort of virtual exercise program but they have more limited involvement from licensed physical therapists um, throughout the process, both at the intake step and then in terms of managing the exercise regimen and checking on uh, the progress of the patient throughout. The middle category, physical therapist guided solutions, each have taken the APTA pledge and have licensed physical therapists engaged at every stage. So you may have a live sort of telehealth visit with a PT at, the, at your intake and evaluation stage. Uh, the physical therapists are then overseeing the exercise programs and making adjustments based on um, you know, how things are going for the patient. And uh, they may be checking in at various points, um, either driven by the PT or driven by the patient request. The third category is, is somewhat different. So the first two categories are each intended to be um, sort of standalone care patterns. They're often sold um, to employers and to some extent to health plans, um, really on sort of a per member per month uh, or other cost basis. Um, but they are generally intended to be used in lieu of in-person PT. Whereas the third category, um, which is remote therapeutic monitoring augmented solutions, is really being used in addition to in-person PT. So these solutions, Limber is one of the largest ones, but not the only one, um, are being sold to in-person physical therapy offices. And you may go for in-person physical therapy. They recommend that you then do exercises between your visits at home, and you're using the computer technology um, to conduct those visits. Uh, and then that data is going back to your sort of in-person PT. So that's really sort of layering on top of other in-person care. So what did we find? So in uh, looking at the primary clinical outcomes of pain and function, um, we actually established two comparator groups uh, for this evidence review. So the first comparator group is what we call usual care. And this is really a wide range of existing uh, treatment, but it is generally not involving in-person PT. So this could be people who 
hurt themselves, uh, you know, have, have an injury and never see a doctor and just basically wait for it to get better. Um, or it can be somebody who, you know, starts and goes and sees their PCP, goes and gets imaging, gets recommended for rest or icing, um, but never is going to do in-person PT. And compared to that sort of usual mix of usual care across all three categories of intervention, patients that did not do in-person PT but had other care um, did better when they used a digital health solution. So the digital health solutions improved pain and function for those patients better than all other usual care uh, paradigms. So the second question then, so then you say, okay, for someone who's not gonna do in-person PT for any number of reasons, these solutions provide real uh, clinical value. Our second question was, do they have the potential to substitute for in-person PT for people who may find them more convenient or more accessible uh, to do that, that therapy at home? And that was a place where we were really pleased to see that the, the second and third category, the physical therapist guided solutions and the RTM solutions, both had clinical performance that suggested that they were comparable to or better than in-person PT, meaning that for a certain subset of patients, uh, they could be substituted. Now, importantly, the RTM augmented solutions actually had superior clinical benefits to just PT alone. And that sort of makes sense because that's a sort of category where folks are doing in-person PT. The people that do extra exercise at home get even better, even more quickly. Um, we also looked at a range of secondary outcomes. I mentioned there were 13 more um, outcomes other than pain and function. And generally what we saw are some signs of mental health improvement um, for users of these technologies. Um, that wasn't that surprising uh, because actually what we have found is that as folks pain goes down and their functional status improves, you tend to see those mental health uh, improvements along with it. And so that was very positive. Um, we also saw improvements in workplace productivity and reduction in the use of opioids um, for people who use the digital health solutions. Um, again, really tied to those uh, sort of primary clinical outcomes that we saw uh, throughout those, those results. Um, from a user experience point of view, the virtual solutions performed well. Um, we had similar retention rates, um, meaning that folks sort of stayed in both in-person PT um, or virtual PT um, for about eight weeks, which is kind of the average. Um, there were more sessions completed for the people using the virtual PT. Uh, and then from a health equity point of view, you know, we not only understand that these solutions can improve access to people who may not have good, good um, ability to go to in-person PT, um, but we also saw very strong results both clinically and in terms of engagement um, for diverse populations as well as for older adults. And that was great because we, you know, often think that one of the true promising uh, opportunities for digital health tools are these underserved communities. Um, and so we were really happy to see that um, the performance of these tools in the hands of those communities really de delivered uh, equal or better results. So um, looking down sort of this second column, the clinical effectiveness column, um, here what you see uh, are some very nice green dots. So we saw, um, you know, for the app-based exercise therapy, as I mentioned, um, though the clinical results were better than uh, usual care, um, but, but did not demonstrate uh, equivalence or comparability to in-person PT. Um, for physical therapist guided solutions, we saw improvements in pain and function um, that were comparable to in-person PT. And then again, RTM augmented solutions actually performed better um, from a clinical effectiveness point of view. So with that degree of confidence, then we begin to say, you know, at what cost? Um, and so we conducted a, a budget impact model over one and two years across a number of scenarios um, and pricing models. And what we find there is that the physical therapist guided solutions um, actually have the ability to decrease overall healthcare costs for two reasons. First, if they substitute for in-person PT, you can deliver virtual therapy um, at a lower cost, largely because those solutions are scaling the physical therapy benefit and not requiring that one-to-one -one, um, human interaction.
but also because as a result of the clinical outcomes that we described, um, you do see some signs of avoided uh, care, including surgery and other outcomes. That's an evidence base that really deserves um, a bit more, uh, you know, a bit more uh, evidence generation. We can talk about that more. But, um, you know, because the solutions are accessible um, and folks are more easily able to adhere to them, there's some uh, clinical benefits yield cost savings as well. Um, on the RTM uh, solutions, because the RTM solutions are actually increasing spending, so they're not substituting for in-person care, it is not clear that the health benefits that they're generating are sufficient to offset the cost of the RTM billing. But I will note that this is a very uh, nascent area. The RTM codes are quite new, and there's really limited data publicly available yet about actually what the billing patterns are. And so um, we're eager to, to follow this closely, but there are certainly scenarios where um, people that are doing relatively short focused episodes of RTM um, may be able to do that at a price that is effectively break even and offsets, uh, you know, it's justifies that sort of uh, superior clinical performance. So, um, you know, we really thought that this uh, deserved um, broader adoption, particularly for those th physical therapist guided solutions. And, you know, some real thinking about which of these solutions are going to be best for your population. So, um, you know, at a lower price point for a broad application, those app based exercise therapies may be good for folks that wouldn't otherwise go to in person PT. And for very complex patients, um, there is certainly clinical evidence that those RTM solutions are delivering a lot of uh, benefit and um, could be targeted to some of those higher need patients. Um, as we think about um, opportunities, uh, we I did make note that um, all of these solutions, many of these solutions um, are being sold through the wellness benefit and less often through the medical benefit. And you know, that really limits the ability to integrate them fully into the rest of care. Um, they don't necessarily show up in provider networks. You're not seeing providers referring to um, virtual solutions. And so I think we both um, don't get the full clinical benefits or the full enrollment um, that these solutions might merit, given that they are largely sitting outside of the core medical care today. Um, Certainly, this underscores the benefit of more um, PT early in the care process and trying to get folks into a physical therapist before they go to their orthopedic surgeon or to their PCP. Um, and generally speaking, we felt like there was um, really an opportunity to pursue a variety of value-based arrangements um, or performance-based contracting, given the really strong clinical and economic evidence that we're seeing here. Uh, and so I'll just tee up before I turn it back to Stephen um, that we've got two more reports um, forthcoming. Our next one will be on um, digital hypertension management. And then um, late this year or early next year, we will uh, have a report on virtual care for depression and anxiety. And so with that, uh, I look forward to Q&A. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, it's so interesting. And, and again, such a different, um, I mean, certainly a different outcome, but it's obviously a different category. So there's a lot of different things that you looked at and ways that you looked at it from your first report to your, um, to your second report. I, and then you're going to focus on hypertension. And so I, um, talk a little bit more about I, just generally, we'll get into the specifics of, of MSK and stuff, but like, how did, why did you pick this category? What is your decision-making process for figuring out what areas to explore and investigate? Because obviously there's a million gazillion different areas you could. It's also different ways of slicing and dicing it. And so how, how did you pick this? Yeah. Um, we have really sort of three broad criteria that we're looking for as we're picking categories. Um, first, we are looking for categories of large spending impact or the potential for a lot of spending impact. Um, so, you know, there's lots of promising technologies in relatively niche clinical areas, and that's certainly not where we're starting. We're starting with the big ticket items. Um, then we are looking at the sort of speed of innovation. So, you know, are there a lot of companies coming to market, growing? Um, you know, do we think that this is a place where there's sort of enthusiasm about the technology? 
um, that warrants you know, this, this assessment approach. Um, and then third is really thinking about um, you know, at what stage of adoption are these solutions? So we wanna catch them at the sort of steep part of the adoption curve where um, a report like this could help accelerate patient engagement with virtual solutions. Um, right, or could uh, really change the way payers or, or um, employers are thinking about uh, these contracts as part of their future benefit packages. So those are sort of the qualitative criteria. Um, and then we honestly, we talk to the Purchaser Advisory Council and say, you know, what, what point solutions are you using now? What are you thinking about in the future? How do you, um, you know, what, what's on your mind uh, to make sure that we are putting forward topics that are going to be meaningful to folks? And at a certain point, you're gonna you're gonna run out of like big topics. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, you could keep going forever with things that are smaller, but you're trying to have a big impact. And so, you're gonna at some point, whether it's seven reports or fifteen reports or whatever, you're gonna run out of like big topics. Yep. Is your plan then to revisit these? You know, one of the things you mentioned towards the end was um, with the I think with the um, the, the RTM augmented uh, solutions was that you really look forward to following this category because it's a little more nascent and and there's going to be more data generated and more billing and more claims and you'll see how it evolves. It, does that feed into, do you have some uh, schedule for formally revisiting th these things or how is that going to work? Um, we So we definitely plan to revisit topics and we do not have a formal schedule. Um, because our guidance is actually that we want to revisit any topic when either the body of evidence has changed enough that it's going to say something meaningfully different, or that the solution, the, the technology or the approach has changed enough that really what we're looking at, you know, the intervention has changed. Um, and this is a field where, you know, solutions are constantly iterating and improving. And so, you know, my guess is if we look at any of these reports three years later, it will feel really stale. Um, yeah. and we'll be needing a refresh. Um, but, you know, some will be faster. Uh, and, you know, and there'll be some variants. So for instance, on diabetes, we looked specifically at non-continuous glucometers. And we heard a lot of feedback that many of these solutions believe firmly that continuous glucose monitoring is going to be very impactful in terms of outcomes and that they are really sh shifting hard to CGM. So as soon as we think there's good evidence on CGM, we will certainly uh, look at that. Um, one other thing I'll say to you is, um, you know, AI is growing. We're doing a lot of work to say, how do we think about um, increasingly moving into sort of AI-based solutions? That's going to require a bit of a different and, and, and administrative solutions, not just clinically facing solutions. Um, obviously, that requires a different framework. And then the other area is really sort of technology-enabled services, more, you know, solutions that are more about um, provider enablement and are going to really um, vary based on sort of workflow and integration and, um, you know, the provider group that's that's using it. And we're doing a lot of work right now to be prepared to do those things well in the future. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, if you pick a technology category rather than a therapeutic lens, that's obviously a really different path to to go down. So we're yeah. curious to see how that, uh, uh, how that plays out. Um, how do you, there's a question about this uh, version of this, but I was also just curious, how do you know if you're evaluating the right solutions? You know, you picked eight. They, uh, they've raised between fifty and eight hundred something million dollars for Pinge and the high end. Uh, there's a lot more companies than that out there. I, I don't know exactly how much other ones have raised. Maybe there was a threshold of fifty million dollars. But just curious, like, how do you, how do you, why these eight? Why not eleven? Uh, how do you figure that out? Yeah, um, we try to set very clear inclusion criteria um, about sort of the, so that you're you're doing a roughly apples to apples comparison. We understand that every solution is different, um, but as we're creating categories, we want them to be reasonably similar because one of, what we're doing is looking at the evidence across that category, um, you know, and if one company generates a really good study about performance, um, you know, its competitor may benefit from that if we believe that the kind of mechanism of action and that technology is similar. So, um, you know, we don't want everybody running all the same studies 
uh, all at once. That's not necessarily going to be the most efficient innovation model. So, um, so one is, you know, we try to set tight inclusion criteria. We try to then get basically every company that should qualify within those criteria. Um, obviously, the judgments around that are hard, and so, you know, folks often ask questions, and we can answer why we made a decision or not a decision. But we're trying to get sort of a comprehensive view within a pretty tight. Um, set of criteria. One of the most important ones that we're using right now is um, funding, outside, you know, investment funding, um, which is, you know, a, a imperfect proxy for company maturity, stability, yeah. scale. Um, and, you know, that is intended for two reasons. One, um, if a health plan or an employer is going to sort of turn on a solution, they're expecting it, a company of a certain size to be able to support their membership. Um, and two, and they want it, they want confidence that it's going to be around in five years, which is not something I can give them, but <laughs> money helps. Uh, yeah. And, you know, two is if we're going to be asking, evaluating companies for evidence generation, um, and you've got sort of really big guys and really small guys, it's not, it's not a totally fair uh, playing field to sort of expect that some new innovative company is necessarily going to have great evidence in the first couple of years. And do you... Um... How do you weight, you know, the namesake of the Institute has, you know, was, has like the legendary in terms of federal budget and, and reducing costs and, you know, it's sort of the uh, larger than life figure in that realm. And, and so obviously cost is a huge part of what it is that you're trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. You clearly stated that it's not just cost though, it's also quality, and how do you weight those things when you're looking at solutions? Um, so we always start with clinical. Uh, you know, if it if the thing is not clinically valuable, uh, then we're not that concerned about the cost. Um, yeah. Right. It, it, now, could something be basically clinically equivalent or almost equivalent and really saves a lot of money? Then sure, worth talking about. But if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Really, it, there's no there's no value there. Um, so clinical is paramount, um, but we do fundamentally believe that technology across all uh, sectors of the economy, um, you know, is a mechanism to scale and, and increase efficiency and that we need that desperately in healthcare, right? I mean, we spend a lot of our, uh, you know, a huge portion of our GDP, 19%, uh, yeah. I'm going to, if I got that, if I'm out of date on that, I'm going to be in trouble. But, um, right, we spend a huge portion of our GDP on healthcare. We're not getting the outcomes we deserve. So, you know, we do think technology needs to help us get to where we all want to be uh, in terms of health healthcare performance. But it starts with clinical. None of us are willing to sacrifice, um, you know, our health for, for money. How, there's a uh, take on that. Uh, on this conversation and as one of the questions. And it's, you know, the question is is related to the fact that for the most part, we're not in a value-based care system now. Mm -hmm. We're in a fee-for-service system. And so when providers look at solutions, they are looking for things, for clinical solutions. They're looking for things that work, that produce positive outcomes. They may be looking for things that save money, that reduce costs. Um, but not necessarily. They will also look for things for sure that that can increase their top line. Mm -hmm. And that's a win for them. Mm -hmm. Better outcomes increases the top line. And in a world where, where we're in a fee-for-service world, that is a completely logical decision for those entities to make. That's what you and I, that's what you would do if you're running one of those things. But that's, you know, we're slowly, I think, fits and starts maybe moving towards a value-based care system in the interim is that part of at all of your calculus if you're saying you know that these particular solutions add costs to the system uh, like at least on a at the current you know you were saying that about the third category at the moment that's what that's what you're seeing um that's a bad thing from looking at it from one lens and certainly from a societal lens, from another lens, it allows, that is a mechanism by which new 
technologies that can potentially improve outcomes and improve health, that's the mechanism to get them into market. And without that mechanism, the technologies won't get out there. Is that at all part of your thought process for, for, you know, how you, how you address the economic implications of these solutions? So generally we're looking at, I mean, as an organization, we think really about sort of societal level spending top line. Um, and then we try to really understand uh, each actor's incentives, financial and otherwise, within that system and, and expect everybody to operate within the incentives in front of them. So I think you described the situation correctly. Um, but, uh, you know, so so no, I mean, if, if uh, solutions in a fee-for-service environment are going to be cost increasing, um, then, you know, there's not like a, that's good for getting the technology out. Um, but you know, we're, we're not just calculating the price, we're calculating it against those clinical outcomes. Um, and I think, you know, this is where there's been some interesting conversation actually on both RPM and RTM. So, uh, one of the conversations that I've had with, with some folks in the RTM space is, you know, we sort of assumed the maximum billing because in the remote patient monitoring space, you have absolutely seen providers hmm. um, enabled by by companies, technology companies, uh, seeking to maximize the revenue, as you would imagine, right? So that's it's reasonable to think they would do that. Um, and and what uh, you know, people like Limber and others will say is actually uh, you don't need to build the maximum to get the clinical benefit. And you know, if you can sort of hone that episode of care and the billing correctly, uh, that they can actually you know on a on a on a risk based on a value based basis deliver value both clinical and economic and so you know i think the future of this space is more value based um and uh and more um you sort of risk based capitated arrangements performance guarantees because i think the potential is there and we're hearing that it's there yeah, Limber, by the way, was uh, spent the first few years of their life uh, at Matter as, as a Matter company, so a very he healthy emotional bond to them, and and yeah. uh, I think what they're doing is really interesting, and look forward to as that category um, matures. There is a question uh, specifically about um, about RTM mm -hmm. uh, that's in here that I, I think it may be from a physical therapist, but it's, a, it's a, can you talk about if you found that that those who are using RTM have fewer in clinic visits, which would therefore reduce the cost of care, or not like how, what did did you what did you find there? Yeah, this is this is a great question. It actually ties to the limber point too. So um, let me just back up, right? So the R RTM says that we want to reimburse uh, the theory of RTM. We want to reimburse physical therapists. Um, for over, but enable patients to do exercise at home because we know that they can, right? They don't have to come into the clinic. It's good for them, uh, but we should recognize the cost of, of that to the therapist. Um, and there is absolutely a model where if you reduce the, you know, if you say, okay, you were supposed to come in three, three times a week, but now you're only, you as a patient are only going to come in once a week and you're going to do the exercises at home between then, then all of a sudden the math on the, on the economic model starts to change. And so that's where I say um, that, you know, implemented correctly, there's lots of potential. You can get the full clinical benefit and it doesn't need to cost more. However, the codes are set up as fee-for-service codes and the incentive for, you know, just the, incent yeah. the inherent incentive there is to maximize billing. And so that's where you say, okay, well, do you have a provider like Limber that's sort of not approaching it that way? Do you change the way the codes are set up, you have to sort of think carefully about how to align the incentives towards that good outcome, which I think is very plausible. Yeah, so I guess this, this all loops back to your point that we're early in that journey uh, and, we'll, and we'll continue to see how that plays out. Yeah, we're working on some modeling, which probably will be out next week, which actually puts out some scenarios around RTM, right? Like to this point, if you, if you slowed down the number of in-person visits, How's the budget change? If you you know if you don't bill to the maximum, um, how's the budget change? And so that people can sort of see some of that dynamic. I think that's a really 
I mean, not just what that substance of that, but it's just an interesting point about you and your organization. That these aren't static reports that come out and collect dust. It's it's there. It's sort of a living thing that you'll keep adding to. I, let me. So one of the key trends in the space, and you, and you called out um, somewhere in the report different sort of enabling technologies, and you mentioned computer vision as one of those. Mm -hmm. You just sort of like a paragraph or two on computer vision and how that works and and that is undoubtedly a key technology that enables a lot of these solutions that you know 10 years ago the tech that wouldn't we wouldn't have these kinds of things right um you know there's a reality that not all computer vision systems are created equal and there are quite significant differences across solutions in the the number of points that they track the accuracy of those tracks and then the ability to take that data and translate it into real-time feedback and motion replays and things like that. Did you analyze at all the technology and the types of, in this case, computer vision, but it could apply to a couple other types of tech enabling technologies that you there. Yeah. And, you know, is that something you, you dug into? Um, did you get a sense of kind of, you know, how the industry is advancing in the space, um, I, which I would think is is part of the key to making these interventions more effective and and even more, more scalable. Um, or, or was your analysis really, you know, it's cost, it's pain and it's function and and how you get there is not your purview. Like, how are you, how did you look at that? Well, we're limited by the evidence available to us. So in this case, um, so we've done demos, you can sort of perceive differences in all these solutions. Um, there is not any outcomes evidence yet that helps us separate the quality of the computer vision, the quality of the technology to actual clinical outcomes. And there certainly are differences that are per perceptible, right? But you don't, we're not giving weight to this seems a lot more accurate uh, unless we've got evidence that not only that it is, but also that that is important in terms of, you know, there's lots of technology that gets added to a solution that may or may not actually affect the end clinical outcome. It may affect the user experience or whatnot, but we're sort of looking at those end points pretty carefully. Yeah. Um, I was talking to somebody about this yesterday though, who said, you know, yeah, there's a long way to go in terms of the accuracy of these measurements. And we believe those measurements are gonna be important. So I think it's gonna get there. Um, but the interesting thing right now is actually, you know, movement matters. I, I think the biggest takeaway from our report <laughs> is, a, is a relatively non-technological one, which is movement matters, exercise matters. Um, it helps a tremendous amount and whatever you can do to get somebody to do that, um, will make them feel better quickly. And, um, and then the second is that, you know, licensed professionals overseeing that matters even more. And, and can really deliver more benefit. How do you, I don't know if this is on your roadmap, I could see a world where at some, you know, sort of like the FDA, once they get comfortable with a particular type of technology, especially in the device world, but even in therapeutic world, but it, that can then, they then sort of have a baseline understanding of, okay, this technology is good and it does this and it makes it easier for them in their review processes for future solutions that build on that those same technologies. I'm just speculating for you that maybe down the line you'll sort of have something like that. But um, I, you know, one of our uh, company, one of our current companies is, is Chemtai. They're in the computer vision space and they mm -hmm. work with a lot of the companies that you, a number of the companies that you profiled. Mm -hmm. um, I what. What advice, based on what you heard from the market, payers, providers, what advice would you have for that? I mean, their biggest goal, which is aligns with the goal of a number of the companies in your report, which is to grow the market and and expand the of the um, the market for these these kinds of of solutions. I, what advice do you have for them? Um, for both the health system lens and the the payer lens, I know you've you spend a lot of time talking to health systems and payers and about these things. Um, yeah. what, what would you advise them? Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, 
to me, the biggest challenge in the in this space right now is um, is like user acquisition, um, right? It's like a marketing issue, and I don't yeah. mean customer. I don't mean health plan acquisition, right? I mean most health plans have a MSK solution on board. Not all, but most. Um, and you know the issue is that like patients don't know to look into them. Um, and I, you know, I tell this story in my letter, I had a, I had a very serious broken leg, um, last year and did many, many hours of PT. Yeah. And it wasn't until six months after my accident that, uh, you know, I got my first letter from the company, one of the companies in our report, right. Saying you're eligible for our services. And I was already six months in with, with Joseph, yeah. my PT, um, <laughs> but you know, I travel for work. I've got, I got a busy life. Like it would have been great. I'm a perfect candidate uh, for, for virtual therapy. And, um, and so I think it's about how do we actually like get people to try it? Um, and again, it's a very non-technology technological answer, but that's how you grow the pie, right? It's just like yeah. the person who sits at home and doesn't run for a week because their ankle hurts, like need to know they have this available and know that they can, can try the program. Um, because the potential, the untapped potential is huge here. Did you, I, sort of on that vein of a little bit on that vein, I, I thought it was interesting in this report that you aren't just looking, you know, different from an FDA. You're not just looking retrospectively at the data to determine X, Y, Z. You're also making recommendations, both observations and recommendations to the, for other stakeholders in the industry about how to potentially optim how to think about optimizing the benefits of these kinds of solutions you you know you called out um you know medical uh, that these things are often in the wellness category which really doesn't make a lot of sense and so putting it in the making it more of a medical benefit you know value based care other things and that's a very different kind of activity than doing an analysis and a report on data uh and is how this is more of a phdi question i guess like how fundamental is that to your mission and and as you think about the ways that the change that you are trying to make in the world how fundamental is that kind of stakeholder market moving recommendations as compared to the analysis of the solutions um, that are kind of the core of your report? Yeah, um, it, it's completely fundamental to what we're trying to do, right? We would like to be market makers uh, to mm -hmm. some extent um, because we believe so much that this these these solutions and this technology are what is necessary for the future of healthcare that we all want. Um, and, and we really believe it. And so it's not an academic exercise, right? I don't need, yeah. I'm not just trying to do a literature review um, for the sake of publication. I mean, you know, we don't, but, uh, and, and in order to have that influence, we want to just, we want, we're trying to do that translation, which is um, we have to do a really rigorous sort of academic job on the data review so that it's credible. Um, but then, you know, we really view our position in the market as to be able to translate that and to speak to the people who are ultimately going to use that information to make a different decision, recommend something to their patients, um, because that's how we're going to see the change that we want to see. Uh, yeah. So we'll continue to lean into that. And that's honestly why we do these sorts of conversations too, right? I mean, I could hide in an ivory tower, but um, I'd, rather I'd rather come out and really engage uh, with folks who are, you know, on the ground doing this work. Yeah. Uh, well, speaking of on the ground, there's a question about, um, did you segment different PT solutions or not PT solutions, applications like hip replace, post hip replacement surgery, post knee replacement surgery, post, you know, the kind of thing that you went through, where you, you know, I, or are you looking, or did you just look at PT applications overall? Uh, so we did not look at um, pre and post op. So really, my broken leg post op not applicable, um, and sort of like pre uh, joint replacement 
uh, therapy is, is a specific thing with a specific evidence base and isn't part of this um, report. So this is kind of regular, you know, I lifted something heavy, my back hurts, I twisted my ankle, um, you know, I have neck pain, uh, kind of your, your just daily run of the mill MSK pain, which is a, is a huge proportion of the MSK suffering out there. Um, the other thing that's excluded is um, sort of neurodegenerative diseases. So Parkinson's disease or other things, um, again, really kind of different therapeutically. But within generalized MSK, um, there's a bunch of different body parts. Uh, interestingly, in the literature, they are sometimes separated and sometimes mushed all together. Uh, but, you know, we did sort of look at the full breadth and found the results hold really across that, you know, all of those uh, body parts and, and acute and chronic. Um, it was a real big mix of conditions. Got it. Um, I have a number of other questions that I would like to ask you, and there's a few more in the in the Q and A, um, but we only have three minutes left, and uh, I want to be respectful of your time and everybody else's time. Uh, questions that don't require a lot of time. Um, when are you expecting your hypertension and depression reports to come out? <laughs> That'll be evasive. Uh, hypertension in the fall. Uh, I think I think mental health is looking like uh, Q1 instead of Q4, given given where things are. Um, we'll be more specific as we get closer. Uh, but the honest answer is we're doing them right and not doing them fast. Um, but we are doing them as fast as we can. I oh, could have been much more evasive than that. Uh, <laughs> that seems reasonable. Fall and Q1, um, at least to me. Uh, there's a question whether the slides will be available um, that you presented, sure. if it's okay if we send those out to people who, great. Um, well, with that, uh, I will um, I will, will wrap it up and say thank you. Um, I really, I always enjoy these, uh, these conversations and your perspective, and I think what you're doing is so uh, interesting and needed in the evolution of digital health solutions as interventions to improve health and, and the business of healthcare. Um, I hope that you'll come back as you continue to release uh, more reports. Um, and, and for everyone else who joined today, we have uh, some other upcoming programs that uh, if you, you can see them at matter.health slash events. Um, and I hope uh, to see you at at a uh, future of our talks. Um, thank you all for joining. And Caroline, again, thank you so much uh, for what you're doing and for uh, being part of uh, these conversations. Thank you so much for having me. I hope everyone has a great day.